now it's over to Dilip. Thank you, Yasmin. Can I just leave this here? So let's see. Um, I hope you can. Mics. These are also mics. All right. There's one near you. That well, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, my thanks to the organizers for this opportunity um, to say some words about India. And uh, let me start by saying that what we are up against is something that has been in development for many decades. Uh, we in India call it communalism. Uh, the word communalism has different connotations in different parts of the world. In India, it's a developed uh, pejorative connotation. It has to do with the mobilization of communities around communal hatred for other communities and so on. More specifically, it has to do with a certain approach to nationalism, which developed very long ago during the national movement itself. So there's been a long-standing struggle going on. There's a tension and battle going on in India between different competing versions of nationalism. And uh, there's on the one hand the, um, the inclusive nationalism of Gandhi, which in Urdu is called Muttahida Qamiyat, which means uh, composite nationhood. Uh, and on the other hand, there are sectarian definitions of nationalism, which go by the language of, say, Hindu nation, Muslim nation, and so on, or Sikh nation. And uh, this is at the root of it. Uh, it's a very long, uh, uh, it's a very complex issue, and I can't possibly uh, tell you much about it, but it's something that is at the root of the problem. Um, we are faced with a prolonged and staggered kind of uh, fascistic movement. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, it's not an apocalyptic uh, kind of fascism that Europe uh, faced in the 1930s. It's something far, uh, far different from that, but in essence, that's what it is. And uh, um, I've developed an argument about this. I've been arguing about this position since 1984. Um, it's, I've, I've written about it at length. If you wish to read it, it's in an article called The Law of Killing, A Brief History of Indian Fascism, which I have put up on my blog as well. Uh, the entire article is there, and there's a whole book on fascism in India, uh, which has been edited by Jairus Panaji. This is humming a bit. Um, so uh, the point is that we are faced with a situation. I, I think people can hear. All right. OK, OK, fine. OK. Um, we have a situation of uh, staggered episodes of violence, genocidal mania ruling the streets, hooligans being given command of the streets, hooliganism being given some kind of ideological justification, and uh, and systematic undermining of the rule of law, systematic undermining of the legitimacy of the state, privatization of armies, privatization of vigilantism, all this is going on in a staggered way for, for very many decades, so much so that it's become part of common sense, it's become normalized. We have the normalization of brutality. If you actually wish to examine it and go into what act happened in Gujarat in 2002, it's very easily accessible. You can you just... Add, just click your Google search and you find out what bestiality characterized the way in which the people who are in power today, the way in which they treated uh, you know, ordinary citizens of India. So uh, groups of citizens of India systematically are opposed to the most unimaginable and indescribable atrocities and then forgotten about. And what we have is a process of ghettofication, demonization of entire communities, and episodes in which uh, a pro systematic program of barbaric violence is directed at people. Now, even the numbers don't matter so much. You know, uh, recently there were more riots in Uttar Pradesh and India last year, and we find that there's a large number of people have been removed from their homes. People get transferred out of their homes. A population transfer takes place. Now, all this is a historic phenomenon. It happened during the partition of India. We are still paying the price for the partition of India. We are reliving the partition of India on a, on a monthly and annual basis. Uh, it's difficult to explain all this in the course of a few minutes, but I was in, in India, in, in Delhi in 1984, when I, I was personally witness to a pogrom, the kind of which my father used to describe when he had witnessed it in the, during the days of partition in Cal, the great Calcutta killing of 1946. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime, but I saw it. 
I mean, uh, the, that was a slaughter of six, something like 3,000 people were killed. The legal process was stalled and the justice still has not been made available. So that was done by the so-called mainstream party of Indian nationalism, the Indian National Congress. And subsequently, you, people don't notice this. Actually, in, in the 1984 elections in India, the Congress party received overwhelming majority of the votes in the Lok Sabha. And the BJP, which is in power today, got only two. They had two seats in parliament. Now, this, the, the, there's a big question here, and the, 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 the answer is quite simple. All their supporters shifted their votes to the Congress. So it's a very complex issue, and I don't have time to just to do more than simply indicate to you what's going on. But it's a pro process in which violence and intimidation and ideological perversion of the worst type plays a very intimate role. I mean, look, f for an ex example, in the Great Hall, in the Hall of Parliament in India, there's a portrait hung of the man who was the prime mover of the Gandhi assassination. Few people comment on it. V.D. Savarkar is a prime mover of the assassination of Gandhi. His portrait is in the Lok Sabha, installed there in 2003 when the first BJP government came to power. The man is on record as writing that uh, Shivaji uh, was very stupid by not raping Muslim women. He ought to have, you know, ordered the rape of women. I mean, this is a medieval hero, you know. Uh, people should investigate Savarkar's views on women and rape. You know, punitive rape is part of the ideology. And now, if you tell this to the, we should have an open discussion on this. BJP should be asked, what is their line on punitive rape? And if they say that we disapprove of it, they should be shown the text by Savarkar because he approves of it. So I'm saying that we have an ideological climate of extreme uh, hatred and perversion. And it's being reproduced on a daily basis. And the party that is in power today uh, Narendra Modi, I mean, th there is a specialized, I would say that it's a, it's a culture of nihilism. The systematic destruction of intelligible speech, accompanied, of course, by a justification of violence. I'll give you an example. During the election campaign, Narendra Modi went to Assam and declared that rhinoceri are being culled to make room for Muslims. It's a meaningless statement. But this is what he said. If rhinoceri are being culled in Assam, it's to make room for Bangladeshis. So you, this goes on all the time. Uh, the RSS was implicated directly in, the, there was an interview published in the caravan. The RSS, which is the, actually the godfather party of the BJP, was implicated in the Samjhauta Express blast of, a few years ago in which about 60 or more uh, Pakistani uh, visitors to India were blown up and burnt alive in a train. It's involved in it, but the state is not pursuing it. The Narendra Modi himself, there should be several criminal cases against him. The only reason, the, the only way he could stay out of jail was to become prime minister. The fact is that he presided over mass murder. So either he's incompetent or he's malevolent or he's both. Now we can't say this. If I said this in any gathering of this size in Delhi, the likelihood is I would be assaulted. A person who spearheaded a movement against superstition, Narendra Dabolkar, was murdered last year, and he was given an, he was given an open warning that we, we did it to, what we did, to, remember what we did to Gandhi, we'll do it to you. He was killed. They haven't found the murderers. Everybody knows who the murderers are, but we haven't found them. The situation is one in which there is an ideological project which has an ideal of Hindu Rashtra, of Hindu supremacy, and I'm not saying that all Hindus are like that. That's not the case. The fact is that actually there is a very strong uh, opposition to extremism on the side of the, uh, of the Hindus. And that is why they've never succeeded. But they have launched a very strong effort. And we have to keep that in mind. Now, it's not something peculiar to India. The fact is that India was partitioned on the ground of, of religion. And the fact is that large numbers of Hindus have been thrown out of Bangladesh and, and Pakistan. Large numbers of Hindus were thrown out of Kashmir. The left never talks about it. Literally, there's been ethnic cleansing of Kashmir, of the Kashmiri Pandits. The left never talked about it. So it's a situation in which if you don't take it as a whole, you miss the bus. You have to understand communalism as one phenomenon, not as half a dozen phenomena. You, it's like saying, I like British capitalism in preference to Chinese capitalism. If you don't understand what capitalism is, then you cannot make a su subdivision and attach prefixes to it. So that's the situation we are faced with. We are faced with a staggered form of fascism which is growing, which feeds on violence and hatred. And uh, the only way we can combat it is by an international uh, movement. I don't think there's any other way of combating it. Thank you.